the climate of every country in Western Europe is mild because of the Atlantic Ocean. This is partly due to strong currents in the Atlantic, which carry warm water from the Caribbean to Europe's coastlines. Also, prevailing westerly winds traveling over the Atlantic carry wet weather to regularly irrigate the land. The mild temperatures and moisture promote fertile growth. This in turn provides a variety of habitats for an astonishing range of species. We're on a journey during which we'll explore this wonderful wildlife. The journey began in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Azores. It will end in Iceland. It's a journey from the warm south to the colder north. Previously, we visited Portugal and Spain. We traveled through France. We explored the Channel Islands, the southwest coastline of England, Western Ireland. We now head for Scotland, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland. It's the final part of our extraordinary journey of Atlantic-facing land and its wildlife. Scotland has vast areas of wild landscape. The tallest peak in the Scottish Highlands is Ben Nevis, seen here under cloud. Although it's only around 1,300 meters above sea level, it's still impressive in an unrivaled setting. It's a country which has open moorland. There are forested glens, large lochs, both inland and along the western coast. Although Scotland lies in the northern part of the British Isles and is on the same latitude as southern Alaska, the climate is mild and damp. This is due to the frequent wet weather systems that reach Scotland from the Atlantic. The most southerly point is on the Mull of Galloway. The Headlands Lighthouse is only around 40 kilometers across the sea from Ireland. Our journey of the western coast of Scotland begins north from the Mull of Galloway in Knapdale Forest in the county of Argyll. The forest is a conifer plantation planted nearly a century ago on land bordering Loch Sween, a large sea loch fed by a number of inlets from the ocean. There are many plantations like this throughout Scotland, but Knapdale is special. It's one of only a handful of places in the entire British Isles where you'll see wild beaver. They're European beaver, a species that's quite different to their North American relative. Although the North American and European species look and behave similar, the European beaver is slightly bigger and has a different shaped head. Beavers were once widespread throughout Europe, but became extinct in most countries during the Middle Ages as a result of hunting. They were killed for their fur and for their scent gland secretions. They became extinct in Scotland 400 years ago, but now, in an experiment, beavers from Norway have been released to establish a new home. They're active animals and can completely change a landscape to suit their need. Their speciality is dam building, and they've built one here to create a deep pool. The pool encourages the growth of water plants, a valuable source of food for a vegetarian mammal. 
The dam has been built from sticks and mud, and it's over a meter tall and 30 meters long. It's been built by three or four beavers within two years of their release. A lot of work in a short period of time. Beavers have powerful jaws and teeth and can easily gnaw through wood to fell a tree. It's impressive work by a small animal. The water pool created by the beavers also suits other wetland wildlife. Toads, fish and insects are all attracted to the new environment created by the beaver. All along the western coast of Scotland, there are large sea inlets extending inland. There's sea lochs, or fjords, similar to those found on the coast of Norway. They were formed around 10,000 years ago, when glaciers flowed through steep-sided river valleys, scouring deep basins in the valley floor as they went. When the Ice Age ended, the basins created were filled with seawater from the Atlantic. One of the biggest is Loch Linney, which opens to the sea near the town of Oban. Nearby and further north is another fjord, Loch Sunat. And on the mountain slopes above the loch, and surrounded by conifer plantations, are the oak woods of Ariandel. This is ancient oak woodland, a remnant of the primeval forests that once covered the entire western coast of Europe. This type of habitat is known as Atlantic oak woodland, and the varieties of plants found here thrive in a climate produced by the Atlantic Ocean. Because the woodland is close to the western coast, it rains frequently, and the temperatures are mild, conditions which are perfect for plant growth throughout the year. Mosses, lichens, and ferns flourish here, creating a beautiful wet woodland. This ancient woodland survived because two centuries ago it was protected. It was a valuable asset and managed for the production of wood for charcoal production, which was then used as fuel to extract lead from nearby mines. The trees were trimmed, not felled for wood, and the tree trunks that remained were left to regrow to ensure a sustainable supply. Thankfully, this beautiful woodland found a purpose in an industrial world. It's one of only a few Atlantic woods still surviving. Heading northwest from the mainland of Scotland, you'll find the Hebrides. It's a name that refers to dozens of individual islands. Three of the most westerly of them all are south and north Uist, with the smaller island of Benbecula between them. A large proportion of these islands are covered in water. As much as one third of North Uist is lakes. The remainder is mostly flat, wet land, totally exposed to Atlantic weather. It's a wilderness, however, that's well liked by otters. Otters are found throughout Europe but they usually live inland along freshwater rivers and lakes. Scotland is different. More than half the population live on the coast. They like to hunt in shallow rocky pools with dense seaweed cover. It's here that they find crabs and small fish to eat. On the western shores of North Uist, the rocky pools are replaced by white sandy beaches and dunes. It's a landscape created by prevailing westerly Atlantic winds.
This Atlantic weather has also played a part in the formation of unique pasture land behind the dunes. This is a macher. It's a Gallic name for fertile, low-lying pasture. And from late spring to summer, the macher is a carpet of colorful wild flowers. This is a site you'll see in only a small number of coastal locations in northwest Scotland and Western Ireland. Sand dune pastures on this scale and beauty can only develop in wet and windy conditions near the coast. The underlying acidic peaty soil here is constantly neutralized by sand, which is full of tiny fragments of calcium containing shells. And this helps to form rich fertile land These pastures are also traditionally farmed. During certain parts of the year, cattle and sheep are allowed to graze here. And this further helps to fertilize the land. Few of these flowers are particularly rare, but together they create a magnificent site and one of the rarest habitats in Europe. Moving on from the Western Isles to Wester Ross in the Northwest Highlands of Scotland, you'll find Loch Marie. At 20 kilometers long, it's the fourth largest freshwater loch in Scotland and one of the most precious landscapes in Europe. In the loch, there are more than 60 scattered islands, which, because of their isolation, still carry ancient woodlands, this time not Atlantic oak woodlands, but pine forests. These are remnants of the original Caledonian pine forest that used to cover the entire Scottish Highlands. These trees have been able to grow here for centuries with very little direct influence from people. Some fragments of pine forest have also survived on the slopes of the mountains surrounding the loch. This fragment is on the foothills of Ben A. It's part of the oldest national nature reserve in Britain. It's not so much the heather or the fruits growing on the ground that makes this place special. The wildlife here is typical of Northern Europe uplands. But these Scots pine trees are unique. While Scots pine can be found throughout the world, the trees here are genetically distinct. They're descendants of the original Caledonian race that began to grow here at the end of the last ice age. Because they like a cool climate, Scots pine were one of the first trees to grow when the ice sheets retreated from Europe and by around 6,000 years ago, covered much of the European landscape. As the temperatures warmed, the Scottish Highlands were the last part of the British Isles, which had a climate suitable for them. From the slopes of Ben A and the Scottish Northwest Highlands, we head for the Orkney Islands. The Orkneys are a collection of over 70 islands. This is Scapa Flow, a large body of water tucked within the islands. It's one of the world's largest natural harbors. It's a beautiful haven on a tranquil day. But it hasn't always been this peaceful. During the two world wars, this was the northern base for the British Navy. It was a target for enemy submarine attack and access to it had to be controlled. Four entrances were blocked off at the onset of World War II by constructing concrete barriers between the islands. Even earlier, at the end of World War I, ships from the German Navy were brought here and interned. Many were sunk, and some still exist on the sea floor. Decades later, they're hardly recognizable as ships.
These are old railings. Nature has taken over the entire ship. It looks like a natural reef. These are spider crabs, no bigger than a fingernail. Bigger and more aggressive velvet crabs patrol below the wrecks, looking for food. This is soft coral, called dead man's fingers. It's a colony of creatures living together. They anchor themselves to the sunken iron ship and feed on the floating nutrition in the water. This is a colony of light bulb sea squirts. Their transparent tube shape and yellow internal organs gives them the appearance of a glowing bulb. And here is a common sea urchin. Plumose anemones are also filter feeders. And this is another species of sea squirt, this time in an opaque sac-like shape. Beneath the wrecks, flatfish have come to feed. This is a flounder. When it stays still, it's perfectly camouflaged against the seabed. As it grows older, one of its eyes moves from one side of its head to join the eye on the other side. This allows it to blend into the background and spot its prey at the same time. One of the famous landmarks of the Orkney Islands is the Old Man of Hoy, a sea stack towering nearly 140 meters above the waves. It forms a backdrop to an exposed open landscape. At first sight, the land looks barren of wildlife, but it does in fact support many species, some of them rare. These pink flowers are Scottish primroses. They're found only on Scotland's north coast and the Orkney Islands. Although small, they're very tough plants and have to endure strong North Atlantic winds on this exposed patch of ground. Conditions can also be harsh on the central moorland found on the largest island in the Orkneys, an island called Mainland. Despite the conditions, many species of birds nest here during summer. There are curlew, a long-billed bird, which likes to nest on the ground amongst the thick plant growth. Its nest needs to be well hidden, or its eggs or chicks will soon be eaten by predatory birds like the great skewer. This bird also nests here and further north in Norway, the Faroe Islands and Iceland. When the breeding season is over, it will spend all of its time on the Atlantic Ocean. Hen harriers are also found on the Orkney Islands. This is a male. It's being followed by chicks, which have recently left the nest. These young birds are in the process of gaining their independence. While they may still get some food from their parents, they're quite capable of catching small mice and birds for themselves by sweeping low over the heather on unsuspecting prey. On a remote beach on one of the Orkney Islands, common seals are resting on the rocks. They're the commonest seal species on the planet and are found in all northern seas. These have been fishing in the cold sea. 
and are warming up on the rocks before returning to the water to fish again. The Faroe Islands, north of Scotland. The group of islands have a special atmosphere. They're rugged and rocky. There's a sense of isolation here, in the middle of the North Atlantic, halfway between Norway and Iceland. These two sea stacks are off the island of Esteroy. On the left, the giant. On the right, the witch, named after an old Norse legend. The witch stands precariously on two legs. She may well fall into the sea sometime in the next few decades during a severe winter storm. The landscape on the Faroe Islands is both barren and spectacular. Some of the highest mountains reach a height of 800 meters. Though bleak, the landscape is ideal breeding ground for many birds. This is a wimbrel a bird related to the curlew that we saw on the Orkney Islands. But the wimbrel nests exclusively in the far north. The island's location, surrounded by the North Atlantic, means it's a perfect place for nesting seabirds. One of them is the Arctic tern. Of all the Earth's creatures, Arctic terns migrate the furthest. They fly from the Arctic to the Antarctic every year and, as a result, enjoy two summers. It's a round trip of 25,000 kilometers, an impressive journey for a bird weighing less than 120 grams. Another seabird has chosen the Faroe Islands as its most important nesting spot. They're storm petrels, and they hide under the rocks by day because they're scared of larger birds. We know they're there because they're so noisy. Ornithologist Jens Kel Jensen has been studying these birds for many years. He's erecting a net to catch them. Storm petrels spend most of the year flying over the Atlantic but come to land for the breeding season. When the sun has set and it's dark, the birds venture from their daytime bunkers and a few will be entrapped by Jens's net. It'll be only a temporary inconvenience as Jens tries to gather important information about the petrels. They avoid daylight on land because gulls and larger seabirds kill and eat them. They're a bird designed for long periods of flight at sea. On land, they walk and take off slowly. That, together with their small size, makes them vulnerable to predation. By ringing the birds, we learn a lot about their migration movements. Jens has ringed around 25,000 birds, and some have been found as far south as Port Elizabeth in South Africa. It's an island covered by the scars and dust of volcanoes. A great deal of the land damage is the result of recent volcanic activity. Iceland is volatile because of the island's location in the Atlantic. Just like the Azores at the beginning of our journey, Iceland is part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a chain of mountains running south to north through the ocean, near a large fissure in the Earth's crust. Most of the ridge lies under the sea, but rises to the surface to create the islands of the Azores and Iceland. Iceland sits across the ridge where the continents of Europe and America shift and collide. This is what produces all the energy on the island. Steam created by volcanic activity underground is released almost everywhere on the island.
volcanic activity isn't the only factor shaping the landscape. Cold conditions also have an effect, especially when the ice melts during the summer. The meltwater creates spectacular waterfalls. This one is at Godafoss, Icelandic for waterfall of the gods. Huge volumes of water flow along this glacial river. It has an almost primordial presence, a demonstration of the power of nature. Much of Iceland looks like an alien planet. Scars of volcanic activity are everywhere. Superficially, it's a landscape stripped of vegetation. But here or there, you see some plants and mosses. These are the first to appear after hot ash damage. After decades, even centuries, plant growth begins to completely cover the burnt ground and the landscape recovers. This ancient lava field is at Leiterun. It's found on the southwestern corner of Iceland at the Reykjanes Peninsula. There's not much above ground to suggest a turbulent volcanic past, but underground, there's a remarkable spectacle. Hidden in the landscape, there's an entrance to a cave that was only discovered recently by Icelandic cavers. Underground, the temperature is low enough even in the summer for stalactites and stalagmites of ice to form. There are ice sculptures everywhere. Perfectly formed tunnels stretch far underground. They look as if they've been dug out by man, when in fact they've been shaped by lava. Solidified drips of molten rock hang from the roof. Evidence of hot lava is present on the floor and the walls. A horizontal line halfway up each wall marks the level of the hot lava river as it flowed nearly 5,000 years ago. The series of explosions that formed the tunnels must have been huge. Suddenly the lava flow stops in a dangerous pit that drops down around 17 meters. The deepest lava pit in the world Nobody knows why the flow abruptly ended here. It's one of nature's secrets. Eyjafjordur Bay is located on the north-facing coast of Iceland. The water here is heated by an undersea volcanic vent. Boiling fresh water which originates deep underground, gushes from a chimney. Hot water is clearly visible as it rises and combines with seawater. This chimney has been releasing boiling water for 11,000 years. The released water is full of minerals. As they mix with seawater, they solidify to form limestone chimneys. The combination of warm water and minerals also creates a rich environment for sea life. Seaweed, sea urchins and fish of all shapes and sizes congregate around the chimney. It's a warm haven surrounded by a very cold sea. Here's a fierce looking fish. It's a northern wolf fish, sometimes called the Arctic wolf fish. 
Its mouth is full of large, misshapen teeth. It's actually quite harmless. It uses the large teeth to crush shells, crabs, and other crustaceans living on the sea floor. It's a fish that normally likes cold, deep water and lives in the more northern parts of the North Atlantic. Though it's near relatively warm water here, it's probably been attracted to good feeding near the hot vent. It's accumulated a rubbish pile of broken shells in its lair. Iceland's open landscape is constantly exposed to nature's harshest elements. During winter, the land is covered with snow and ice. In summer, it's exposed to strong winds that sweep across the tundra and constantly blow away any loose soil. Survival is difficult on this dramatic landscape scarred by earthquakes. But there is growth here. They're plants that have adapted for these harsh conditions. This is dwarf willow, a tree that doesn't grow upwards, but creeps along the ground. There are also plants here that can tolerate freezing conditions. Mountain Avon is one. Roseroot is another, a plant that likes to grow in the protection of rocks. With the land free of ice and snow during the summer, the plants quickly come to life and transform the barren landscape to a beautiful one. Cold weather, however, is never far away, even in high summer. Snow and ice cover the mountains all year round. It's July, and this is one of Iceland's largest glaciers. It's melting in the relatively mild temperatures of summer. But the word mild is rather misleading. The temperature is only just above freezing. The meltwater fills the streams and rivers. Thousands of gallons of water are released. And this fuels life in the lowlands. This female harlequin duck is fishing right in the middle of white water flowing from the uplands. She's venturing on rapids that only a few would tackle. She's an excellent swimmer and dives underwater to feed on larvae of black flies. Swarms of the adult flies hover over the river. Black fly larvae live on rocks submerged in water where there's plenty of oxygen. And that's exactly what this fast-flowing river is supplying. While the female harlequin duck is pretty, the male is majestic. It's July, and having completed his courting duties, he will soon leave to live on the coast. The female will follow after she's raised the chicks. They have all they need here, in Iceland. Thousands of other water birds migrate here only for the summer, and many come from mainland Europe. These are tufted ducks. They're common throughout Europe. The large lakes in Iceland are perfect for all kinds of water birds. Iceland is an important nesting site for whooper swans. They feed on grass, and with the ice and snow receding over summer, there's a good supply of plants on the land. When the chicks are old enough at the end of September, the whole family will fly all the way south to Europe to find reliable pastures. The cracks and faults caused by millions of years of continental movements 
add to the drama and character of Iceland's landscape. This is the site of a remarkable fissure called the Silfra Rift, a huge crack in the landscape that separates the continents of Europe and America. It's in the southwest of Iceland, in Thingvallir National Park, east of the capital, Reykjavik. Much of the rift continues underwater to form one of the world's most remarkable pools. Thousands of scuba divers come here each year to experience the clearest water on the planet. On the west side, there's America. On the east, Europe. And in between, crystal clear fresh water, which has been finally filtered on a 50 kilometer journey through volcanic rock and underground wells from a glacier high up in the mountains. It's a journey that's taken a century. The cold temperature of the water at two to four degrees centigrade adds to its clarity. It's the only place in the world where you can literally see as far as you can look while swimming between two continents. Continents which are drifting apart two centimeters each year. This is the line that separates Europe from the Americas. North of Husavik, you'll find the island of Grimsey. It's the only part of Iceland which is in the Arctic Circle. It's a small island, some five kilometers square. But during summer, it's home to a million birds. It's July and the birds have come here to breed, some from mainland Europe. Others have come to shore after spending the rest of the year on the Atlantic Ocean. A few have migrated huge distances. Arctic terns have flown from the South Atlantic. There are virtually no land predators on the island, no foxes, no dogs, cats or rats which is good news for ground nesting birds like dunlin and golden plover that can raise their chicks in relative safety. Both dunlin and golden plover travel south for the winter and most end up wading on the coasts of northwestern Europe. Here is a special northern bird. It's a male snow bunting. This small bird migrates further north than any other songbird. He's marking his territory by singing. The female is nearby. She looks far more insignificant. The pair is nesting amongst the rocks. At the end of the Arctic summer, they too will migrate south to mainland Europe for the winter. Most of the birds on Grimsey Island nest on the cliffs above the sea. They're seabirds you'll see nesting on many Atlantic-facing cliffs of Northern Europe. There are puffins, razorbills and fulmars. But they come to nest in huge numbers on Grimsey because of the island's isolation and the abundance of food in the Atlantic Ocean within the Arctic Circle. It's a rich sea that also attracts whales. These are fin and blue whales, the largest animals on the planet. They've come here to feed on krill, tiny crustaceans that thrive in cold sea temperatures. Many different species of whales migrate during the summer to feed in this part of the North Atlantic. The whales dive deep to catch the krill.
This is a humpback whale. It's a lot smaller than a blue or fin, but is still around 15 meters long. Like the other whales, they're found in northern seas only in the summer. For the remainder of the year, they migrate to more tropical waters to give birth to their young. The largest migration of any mammal. We've been on an extraordinary journey across the Atlantic facing land of Europe. Our adventure began in the Azores, nine volcanic islands located in the middle of the North Atlantic and Europe's most southwestern point. In Portugal, we visited rich agricultural land packed with wildlife. There we saw the amazing courtship display of the great bustard and an astonishing spectacle of vultures. On the French Pyrenees, we found the biggest squirrel in the world, a marmot. On the west coast of France, we traveled through magnificent wetlands. In the seas around the Channel Islands, we found rich sea life warmed by the Atlantic Gulf Stream. The southwest coast of Britain marked a boundary where the seas and climate gradually become cooler and wetter. Here we found species like Atlantic grey seals and gannets that prefer to live further north on the Atlantic coast. The wetter climate in the north leads to dramatic wild landscapes, particularly on the remote western coasts of Ireland and Scotland. The countries facing the Atlantic on Europe's western coast have similarities and differences. As the Atlantic weather systems shift further north during the summer, the landscape of southern Spain becomes more arid compared to the coast of Brittany and France. In the British Isles and Ireland, the constant flow of rain clouds throughout the year leads to rich plant growth. Sometimes the same species lives in many different countries. Red deer and otters are two species that are found throughout Europe. Sometimes, because of the influence of man and loss of habitat, a species has survived only in certain parts of Europe, and sometimes the only part of Europe. Every country has a rich tapestry of life. Each one has its unique character, landscape, and wildlife. But they all have one thing in common the undeniable influence of the Atlantic Ocean. Beavers have powerful jaws and teeth and can easily gnaw through wood to fell a tree. It's impressive work by a small animal. The water pool created by the beavers also suits other wetland wildlife. Toads, fish and insects 
are all attracted to the new environment created by the beaver. All along the western coast of Scotland, there are large sea inlets extending inland. They're sea locks, or fjords, similar to those found on the coast of Norway. They were formed around 10,000 years ago, when glaciers flowed through steep-sided river valleys, scouring deep basins in the valley floor as they went. When the Ice Age ended, the basins created were filled with seawater from the Atlantic. One of the biggest is Loch Linney, which opens to the sea near the town of Oban. Nearby and further north is another fjord, Loch Sunat. And on the mountain slopes above the loch, and surrounded by conifer plantations, are the oak woods of Ariandel. This is ancient oak woodland, a remnant of the primeval forests that once covered the entire western coast of Europe. This type of habitat The climate of every country in Western Europe is mild because of the Atlantic Ocean. This is partly due to strong currents in the Atlantic, which carry warm water from the Caribbean to Europe's coastlines. Also, prevailing westerly winds traveling over the Atlantic carry wet weather to regularly irrigate the land. The mild temperatures and moisture promote fertile growth. This, in turn, provides a variety of habitats for an astonishing range of species. We're on a journey during which we'll explore this wonderful wildlife. The journey began in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Azores. It will end in Iceland. It's a journey from the warm south to the colder north. Previously, we visited Portugal and Spain. We traveled through France. We explored the Channel Islands, the southwest coastline of England, Western Ireland. We now head for Scotland, the Faroe Islands, that is known as Atlantic Oak Woodland. And the varieties of plants found here thrive in a climate produced by the Atlantic Ocean. Because the woodland is close to the western coast, it rains frequently, and the temperatures are mild. Conditions which are perfect for plant growth throughout the year. Mosses, lichens, and ferns flourish here, creating a beautiful wet woodland. This ancient woodland survived because two centuries ago it was protected. It was a valuable asset and managed for the production of wood for charcoal production, which was then used as fuel to extract lead from nearby mines. The trees were trimmed, not felled for wood, and the tree trunks that remained were left to regrow to ensure a sustainable supply. Thankfully, this beautiful woodland found a purpose in an industrial world. It's one of only a few Atlantic woods still surviving. Heading northwest from the mainland of Scotland, you'll find the Hebrides. It's a name that refers to dozens of individual islands. Three of the most westerly of them all are South and North Uist, with the smaller island of Benbecula between them. A large proportion and Iceland, 
It's the final part of our extraordinary journey of Atlantic-facing land and its wildlife. Scotland has vast areas of wild landscape. The tallest peak in the Scottish Highlands is Ben Nevis, seen here under cloud. Although it's only around 1,300 meters above sea level, it's still impressive in an unrivaled setting. It's a country which has open moorland. There are forested glens, large locks, both inland and along the western coast. Although Scotland lies in the northern part of the British Isles and is on the same latitude as southern Alaska, the climate is mild and damp. This is due to the frequent wet weather systems that reach Scotland from the Atlantic. The most southerly point is on the Mull of Galloway. The Headlands Lighthouse is only around 40 kilometers across the sea from Ireland. Our journey of the western coast of Scotland begins north from the Mull of Galloway in Knapdale Forest in the county of Argyll. The forest is a conifer plantation planted nearly a century ago on land bordering Loch Sween, a large sea loch fed by a number of inlets from the ocean. There are many plantations like this throughout Scotland, but Knapdale is special. It's one of only a handful of places in the entire British Isles where you'll see wild beaver. They're European beaver, a species that's quite different to their North American relative. Although the North American and European species look and behave similar, the European beaver is slightly bigger and has a different shaped head. Beavers were once widespread throughout Europe, but became extinct in most countries during the Middle Ages as a result of hunting. They were killed for their fur and for their scent gland secretions. They became extinct in Scotland 400 years ago, but now, in an experiment, beavers from Norway have been released to establish a new home. They're active animals and can completely change a landscape to suit their need. Their speciality is dam building, and they've built one here to create a deep pool. The pool encourages the growth of water plants, a valuable source of food for a vegetarian mammal. The dam has been built from sticks and mud, and it's over a meter tall and 30 meters long. It's been built by three or four beavers within two years of their release. A lot of work in a short period of time. 